Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Okay, so Gary, um, we're here to talk about your, your book. Um, normally what we do at the, at, like towards the end, I'll say to people like, hey, how do, can the people contact you or how do they get your book or whatever the case is. But like a lot of people have dropped off the, the podcast by then. So what I'm going to do is do that now. Well, say, nice. this is the book. And just... yeah, how, how, this is going to come out the day it's released this podcast and uh, tell people how they can get it before we even get started. Okay. Well, first of all, it is the book they should get clearly. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, if they're in independent bookstores open in their neighborhood and they're allowed to walk there and purchase the books, that would be ideal. Otherwise Amazon or Barnes and Noble, of course, which is how we seem to get everything these days. It, Right. So uh, is it available on, on Kindle or anything like that? Yet? It is available on Kindle. In fact, okay. if you live in Australia, it's apparently available now. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Okay, it was supposed cool. to be out in April and then it got delayed for uh, COVID related reasons, but apparently they forgot to delay it in Australia on Amazon. So, Okay, um, well. And, so, and then yeah. uh, what about Audible? Are you going to, are you going to, are you planning to There is Audible? an Audible book. There will be an Audible book. I have oh. not heard it. Um, I am having faith. It's a little odd listening to your own books be read by someone else. Yeah. So, but there's some people, I think Jason Fung's one person that's actually, you know, he's actually read his, his, his own book. Yeah, um, I've thought about offering that. I get a lot of pride out of reading to my children every night. They're still 11 and 15 and they still, well, my 15 year old falls asleep and my 11 year old is into it, sort mm -hmm. of. They humor me and I'm proud of my reading ability, but then I hear my own voice and I still have the Rochesterian New York accent that I had when I was 11 years old, 50 years ago. And it I can't. Doesn't lift you, right? Doesn't, doesn't work for me. So yeah, well, my, my accent hasn't left me either. So it's like, okay. yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, this book is read for most, is written for, to be read by most people. And I had to laugh. Um, I know about page, what's it, 97 or something. It says, I hesitate to use diagrams from human metabolism textbooks in a book meant to be readable by most people. But since this is uh, precisely what, what, this is, what, what you want to know, I'm going to do it just this one time. Okay. And then about 12 pages later, um, you say, with my apologies for the second and last technical <laughs> diagram in this book. <laughs> and then I spent the rest of the book waiting for it to say, no, for real, this is the last one, a third time, but that actually never happened. <laughs> um, I think I phrased it in such a way the first time. If you read that again, I think oh, okay. one is a, one is a, is a, uh, a diagram and one is a graph. Oh, okay. So that's Technically all right. <laughs> different, even though I should have used a different word. Okay. Um, so, it's a problem you have with these books. Um, well, as I was writing it, it's interesting. First of all, the world is full of very, very good books now giving advice on how to eat a keto diet. Yeah. Right. I mean, they come out virtually every month. You've probably interviewed half a dozen of our allies and colleagues out there who have yeah. written and even people who originally were not promoting necessarily ketogenic diets or paleo ish ancestral diets are now moving towards ketogenic diet books or guides on their website. So um, and I don't actually even think of my book, despite the title. So I should backtrack and really dive twist this digression up. Um, originally, I wanted to call the book in praise of fad diets, realizing that my editors would never go for it. But I think it would have forced people to pay attention. The people I want to read it, which are the people who aren't already in our camp. Um, and then it became how to think about how to eat. Because what I wanted to do was something that I don't think anyone has properly done in this field. So to put all this in context between why we've been taught what we've been taught originally about, you know, reducing calories and avoiding fat, where that advice came from, why this advice makes sense, 
and then by interviewing over 120 physicians and then another 20 chiropractors, dietitians, a dentist, I wanted to be able to bring it the sort of weight of there's a lot of people, you know, we now know there's a few tens of thousands, at least physicians out there who think like we do. And, um, you know, the challenges they have and the way they think about it. And there's some very, we have some very smart allies out there. And it was very fascinating to get a chance to learn from them after a lot of them had been learning from us. Um, so, there's all these sort of different goals for the book and all these different targets, audiences. On one hand, you know, I'm not writing to the lean, healthy athlete, the 25 year old who wants to improve his performance, but as he or she gets older and starts to find out that their athletic performance may be independent of their weight and, you know, health status, then they'll become readers for this. Like me, um, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I wanted to be able to put it in context. I wanted people to think instead of like I'm doing, you know, Mark Sisson's keto plan, which happens to be very good, you know, think about it in terms of this is the, the sort of structure by which I have to think about eating so as to maximize my health. And this is always going to be the case. So even as my health changes as I get older, I'm going to learn how to experiment with different uh, aspects of my diet to see if I could, inf how I could, you know, nudge myself back into good health when it starts to slide out. Yeah, so I, I, I was um, surprised that you, in a way, I suppose, that you, that you actually went into it <clears throat> towards the second half of the book, really, is all about actually doing it. And you took, yeah. you took from a personal point of view, a lot of the time where you, um, where you talk about yourself, you just describe yourself right. as one of those people that fattens easily. And so this, this is very real for you as it could be for, for whoever's reading it. Well, this I is, found. it's sort of one of the key aspects. I, I, I refer often back to an article Malcolm Gladwell wrote when he was just, when he was new as a New Yorker writer, he had come from the Washington Post, he was writing for the New Yorker and he wrote a piece on obesity called the Pima Paradox. And this was just three years before my first article on obesity. And in those three years, enough happened that I could take an entirely different perspective. People like Eric Westman and David Ludwig got into the field and started doing their clinical trials mm. and showing that there was a lot to this crazy Atkins diet idea. Um, but Malcolm talked and he was, he was kind of making fun of diet book doctors. And he said, every diet book has the same structure. You know, the doctor is sick or he's fat or he's getting sick or he's getting fatter. And then he, he tries everything and nothing works. And then he goes to the library or he stumbles on some ancient text and he reads up on it. And lo and behold, he tries it and it cures him. And then he tries it on a few patients and it cures them. And now he's writing a diet book about it. And he called this a conversion experience. And he kind of makes fun of it. And he uses it, he discusses, you know, Atkins had it, uh, Barry, the Sears, the Zone doctor had it. Every diet doctor has his conversion experience. And I realized that the conversion experience is actually necessary. It's a necessary step in the scientific process of understanding how to make your body healthy, if not other people's bodies. But if you're lean and healthy, and your patients are lean and unhealthy and you're eating the conventional healthy diet, you know, fruits, grains, uh, the green vegetables, legumes, beans, lean meat in moderation, that kind, and, you're, and it's working for you, then there's nothing to be learned, right? And if your patients are healthy, if you're telling them how to eat and they're all lean and healthy and they look like marathon runners, there's nothing to learn from them. And your scientific progress has stopped, but if you're telling your patients to do that and they're getting heavier and more diabetic with each passing year and you're telling yourself to do that and that's what you're doing and you're getting fatter and heavier now you could experiment right mm -hmm. now you could say geez i better go to that ancient text and start looking in the depths of my medical school library and figure out if there's some way to fix this and nowadays right it's just i got to get on the internet 
you know, I got to Google keto <laughs> exactly. and vegan. And so if you're getting heavier, this is a natural step to take. And this is why the idea and praise of fad diets. Why do people do fad diets? Because the conventional wisdom doesn't work for them. It's not that we're quacks or we're whack jobs or we're crazy or we're not as serious as our thin friends. It's like we try fad diets because when we eat like our thin friends, we get fat or we get hungry. And you get sick. And we get sick. So yeah. then you find a fad diet that works for you. It turns out it's not a fad diet. It's been around for 200 years and mm -hmm. actually was the conventional wisdom until our nutrition community went off the rails. Right. Um, so that's the kind of that conversion experience is absolutely necessary. And if I'm going to talk about it, I had to talk about it, bringing it you know, I had to be honest that when I say, you know, this is how we have to eat. Yeah. Stay lean and healthy or as lean and healthy as we can be by we, I also mean me. And here's my experience. Yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful. You know, um, you, you quoted uh, Dr. Robert Cybers a, a couple of times in your book. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's what what makes what he says, why so many people like what, what he says and, and how he, how he, explains it or whatever because he like he says he calls himself the fat guy and he, you know he's a serious carbohydrate addict carbohydrate addict and he struggles with it every day just like an alcoholic struggles with alcohol and so when he tells people about stuff and how they need to maybe consider doing something um it comes from a very personal place and i, and I think that's what people relate to well um, that's what it's funny, I used to watch uh, back when Nusi was viable, and I, uh, there was a few times I gave lectures with Peter Atiyah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Peter would often talk about his personal experience. And so I've always, as a journalist, I've always shied away from my personal experience. I did talk about it in the first infamous New York Times Magazine article. But as soon as you do, people start accusing you of being biased. Oh, like Atkins worked for you, therefore I can't believe anything you write because you're biased. Um, I would watch how people responded to Peter's personal story and it was very powerful. Mm. I mean, all the studies in the world don't, you know, one personal transformation <laughs> is a very powerful thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm a slow learner, but it was a, you know, this is the kind of lesson when we, one of the, in the insanity of the internet, so uh, Twitter, particularly, you know, Twitter is full of people who have too much time on their hands, right? And uh, so Such the less a toxic environment that I yeah, the less functional work you're doing in society, the more time you spend on Twitter. Um, and a lot of them are young, and a lot of them are too old, and a lot of them are just too unemployed. Um, and so you would always get these people saying, well, look at this guy's talking about it. and this happened to me, even my um, there used to be a picture of me available online where I was giving a lecture at a, at a university in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. And the guy had circled, you know, my gut in this photo and commented that I had a pot belly who was I to be lecturing about nutrition. And ever since then, I swore I started buying uh, tapered dress shirts because <laughs> I realized that I like, what am I going to say? Look, it's a damn shirt. It's just, it puffs up, you know? So now I, I buy the slim fit dress shirts so nobody can comment on Twitter. But so you get all these diet gurus who are naturally lean, healthy, buff athletes who don't know what it means to get heavier regardless of how they eat. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, the way everyone should eat is the way I should eat. So that's what they tell their clients to eat. And that's what they say. And then when they see someone online, like Jimmy Moore is a good example, goes from 400 pounds down to 200 and then floats back up to 280. And they look at him at 280 and they say, look, this fat guy shouldn't be talking about diet. But he used to be 400. The guy I want to listen to is the one who went from 400 to 280, even if he used to be 200. Not the guy who's been 178 pounds his whole life. And the only time he gains weight is when he puts on extra muscle for his bodybuilding competition. Because you know, right. that's not me. I'm not that guy. I don't, you know, I gain weight if I don't watch what I eat. And it's not just muscle, you know. Yeah, I'm not I, typing. So 
Um, I know you said, or you, you, your aim was to, to target um, like everybody with, with this book, but for the most part, the people that are going to listen to this podcast are pretty informed about, about this diet and everything like that. So you talk, you kind of touch on, on some things that um, I was wondering if you, if you were up for just delving and digging a little bit deeper into some of the um, uh, the metabolic issues, some of the, the uh, biochemistry. If uh, oh, biochemistry is not my expertise, <laughs> but just I, I, you know, you just mentioned a, a couple of things. I wanted to see your take on it. I'm interested to hear. Um, you know, so for instance, you were talking about the fact that mitochondria can um, utilize all three macros for, right. for creating energy, right? So obviously glucose we know about, but I've also seen a lot of data showing that, you know, that fat can be directly oxidized um, for, for energy in, in, the, um, in the mitochondria. Um, but I'd never heard about that with respect to protein. My understanding of, of um, what would happen with protein is that it, it goes through gluconeogenesis. If it goes down the, the, um, the energy pathway, it goes through gluconeogenesis to, pre to produce uh, glucose, which then gets metabolized for energy. But you kind of indicated, or I thought it sounded to me like you were saying- Okay, that, I, well, I may have simplified it. Okay. No, you might say protein stimulates insulin secretion, but the way it stimulates insulin secretion is the amino acids being converted. Being converted. Okay. No, that, that's perfect. I just wanted to make sure that you hadn't read something somewhere that, that I wanted well, to I find might out. Well, I doesn't mean it was right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I mean, this is one of the issues that we're always uh, dealing. I got to say one, the thing that, that, and this goes all the way back to good calories, bad calories. And one of the problems with doing this kind of research is you're left with sort of what seems like obvious implications of the work, but the obvious implications of what you're learning are hypotheses. And the other thing we're learning is hypotheses are more often than not, you know, turn out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues with this, the Krebs cycle and the mitochondrial oxidation of fat versus carbohydrates is it seems to be controlled in large part by, you know, uh, leptin and insulin working in the malonyl-CoA pathway. Mm -hmm. So leptin pushes up fatty acid oxidation and insulin inhibits fatty acid oxidation and tells the cell to basically send the fat back to the fat tissue. Um, when I was doing this research, what that meant to me, it seemed like if you're insulin resistant, your cells are being signaled to burn carbs, not fat. I'm not even sure you, they can burn. The mitochondria can burn fat when insulin is elevated. So your fuel is carbohydrates. So you should crave carbohydrates, right? Because right. that's all you're oxidizing when insulin is elevated. So I would call up these people, um, there's a guy at Case Western, Robert Hanley, um, Cahill, when he was still with us. And I would say, am I wrong about this? That this would explain carb craving? Just elevate insulin. If it's in the insulin resistant state, your blood sugar's coming down, carbs are your fuel, that's it. And I would get these responses, which are basically, they never bothered to think about that because they're not really concerned with things like carb craving. And so, I write these things like I assume they're true, but it's right. not like there are rigorous studies. I mean, it should be true. It makes perfect sense. But again, the world is full of things that made perfect sense that just happen to fail experimental confirmation tests. Right. Um, and, sorry, carry on. No, that's... That's it. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, you, you, you touched on insulin resistance and I find, I had a, a uh, I did a, an interview with uh, Ben Bickman, which, which hasn't aired yet, um, but you were talking about insulin resistance where it, it's kind of at a cellular level where some, so it's different for different cells. Some cells are very insulin resistant and some aren't. And I think what you even talked about here was that people are insulin resistant, yet their fat cells are exquisitely insulin sensitive. Um, and 
that's kind of a you know it's an important thing for people to understand is when you're talking about when you talk about insulin resistance you're talking about your muscles and your and your liver and you know other other sort of organs like that well, so, but it doesn't apply to fat cells because no, people like Paul Saladino start to try and muddy the waters now and say oh no you really want to be insulin sense it, it just it confuses well, you, me you do want to be insulin sense you want some hey this is again an interesting no um, sorry just to, to interrupt but what his what his statement was was that you need to you want to be insulin resistant and that's the whole point of a ketogenic diet. <laughs> that was his statement. And Ooh, what the way I try and interpret when, when I listen to the whole thing, him go down this rabbit hole, I feel like he's just talking about the fat cells. And I, even then, you don't want to make him insulin resistant because then that means you're not clearing, clearing the blood of glucose. And I, I, I just so this um, is okay. So there are multiple issues here. One is you're absolutely right. One of the problems we have, and I, <clears throat> kind of why I wrote this book, when I say I want to put things in context, how to think about how to eat. And you know, there's a lot of issues. Everyone who comes along, every diet book doctor has to add something. We all have to add something. Because you can't write just what everyone else wrote before. You have to say something new. And so each iteration of new thinking creates confusion. And some of that new thinking is going to be right, but we have no no idea what, what proportion of it or what to make of it. I mean, the good thing is whether or not you want to think of yourself as making yourself insulin resistant, which I think is a very dangerous way to think because we have to differentiate it from the pathological insulin resistance of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. I assume Paul does and that that's the, the key to his, I, you know, I haven't read his book, so I'm just going to assume that he's thinking in terms of pathological insulin resistance versus non-pathological insulin resistance. Um, but yeah, it, it, it adds to the confusion since the conventional wisdom is funneled through major medical organizations, <clears throat> it always stays consistent, consistently wrong, but consistent. So you could look at our world and say, well, look, there's all these different theories. I mean, he's saying this, this guy's saying that. And, you know, who, who are you going to believe? And so you believe us because what we're saying is always consistent, even if it's wrong. Um, that's one of the problems. When it comes to just the insulin resistance per se, I mean, it was always clear. Well, it's funny, I was thinking about this. I, was like, I did an article on insulin resistance for the journal Science back in 2009. It was one of the last articles I wrote for them. Um, and uh, I interviewed a lot of the experts. And they, the common story you would hear is that uh, insulin resistance is always, uh, you know, uh, the lean tissue and the liver, and that's where you worry about it. That's where it's important. And that's the huge part of glucose uptake. And so whatever's happening at the fat tissue is irrelevant when it comes to this sort of systemic insulin resistance. And uh, therefore the fat tissue isn't really relevant. And what's, I realized, I'm now working on a book on diabetes per se. Um, think about how they measure insulin resistance. So think about what you're measuring, right? You're measuring glucose uptake. Right. So it's purely, that's all they're measuring. So the medical research community thinks of insulin resistance only in terms of glucose uptake. They don't think of what it means in terms. So if you measured insulin resistance, for instance, in the fat tissue, you would measure its effect on lipid mobilization, lipolysis. Okay. Yeah. You could say, and this is similar to a point that uh, Dennis McGarry made in a famous article called What If Mikalski Was a Guzik? And we could talk about that at length. And a guzik means you lose your taste, sense of taste. Um, if you're measuring it differently, you could say insulin resistance is a fat metabolism defect and it's a disorder in fatty acid lipolysis. And when the body starts to become insulin resistant, it inhibits fatty acid lipolysis and you get excess fat formation because fat gets trapped in the fat tissue and it can't get out. Right. And then you would have a curve of sort of insulin secretion versus adiposity rather than versus blood sugar. 
And you'd come up with an entire different way of thinking about the concept of insulin resistance. But the way the conventional authorities think about it is completely determined by how they measure it and what they're measuring. And what they're measuring is glucose uptake. So they've never, in the, this is why you never get any discussion of what's happening at the fat tissue which is changing dramatically as the body is getting insulin resistant and mm -hmm. hyperinsulinemic because that's not what they're measuring. Yeah. I mean, I've also seen um, with the, the glucose tolerance test, they're talking about, oh, one of the bad things about being on, on keto is that, you know, five years down the line or something, you do a glucose tolerance test and you don't clear the glucose as quickly yeah. because you, but it's like, who cares? Like, I, I'm, you know, if it, I, don't, I don't want to process glucose anymore. I'm, I don't, I've got this little yeah. teaspoon in my blood that I really, really need, and that's it. And so um, well, this why, is, is it that, why, why does that matter? Um, yeah, well, that's you know, the way they think, right? So <laughs> the diets are unsustainable to them. Okay, because they and don't they have, to find a, they have to find a way to, to justify or to. Yeah, the to only way to live, that. the only sustainable way to live is to be able to have ice cream cone once a week and french fries and crackers when you crave them. So that's sustainable. Have you looked recently? This was one of the. Um, so again, I'm doing this book on diabetes. I, I don't want to take away from the case for keto, which I think every one of your viewers should read because that's the only way to put all this into context. Right because I'm humble <laughs> <laughs> and I would never lie to your viewers. Um, the, uh, so pre-1920, right? Diabetes is treated by pre-1921, you get an animal diet. It's basically keto. It's fatty meat and green vegetables. That's the, cause you want to minimize carbohydrates cause you can't metabolize carbs on this diet and you want to, um, I, with, diabetes and you want to um, uh, keep calories high. So the way you do that, so the way you prevent the body from starving while minimizing the carbohydrates is that you make it high fat. And then insulin comes along and now you have to give them carbs to balance the insulin to prevent hypoglycemia and hypoglycemic shock. So this hypoglycemia doesn't exist until insulin is invented. And then it's, you have to give people carbs to prevent it from happening with insulin therapy. So carbs become the way you prevent the side effects of the therapy. And then by the mid-1920s, doctors are arguing that they, their patients aren't counting carbs or not. You can't get them to weigh their foods. They can't do this calorie thing. They're going to eat what they want anyway. So why don't we just let them eat what they want and we'll cover it with insulin. So they start advocating and physicians make some pretty, they write some pretty amusing and interesting articles about how their patients are gonna eat whatever they want. So we're just gonna cover it with insulin. And then you get more and more carbs in the diet. That's still the way the American Diabetes Association thinks about it. So the advice they give to their patients as of the last standard of care document last year is tell your patients to eat as, they can eat as much carbs as their friends and their families are eating because that's what they're going to do anyway. And if you tell them to do that, they'll comply to your dietary advice. It's a but, little bit insane. Yeah, I mean, that and, doesn't even make sense. It's just like, well, it doesn't make sense to us because we want to be healthy. What they want to do, I don't know what they want their patients to do. They're trying to avoid dietary nihilism or anarchy or admitting they're wrong. I'm not entirely sure, but I, you get this ADA document. It's stunning. I actually footnoted in the book with the exact words. I synopsize it in the text and then I have a footnote with the exact words because nobody's going to believe what I'm saying is true. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the glucose tolerance says it's interesting going back to pre 1920s. So one of the fears about high fat diets for diabetes was, diabetic ketoacidosis. And the assumption was that once you start generating ketones, you're going to keep generating ketones. And Elliot Jocelyn, who was the god of diabetes beginning in around 1921, um, he had some patients that he thought had been precipitated into diabetic uh, in comas because they had been switched too quickly to high fat diets by their provincial physicians. Um, even back then, you had researchers 
talking about the difference between nutritional ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis. And researchers saying ketones are benign, they're not pathological, they're what show up when people you know, fast for 12 hours. They're gonna generate ketones. They didn't know they were fueling the brain that took George Cahill's work. And so it shouldn't be confused with the diabetic ketoacidosis, but it happens anyway because people are afraid of getting on some slippery slope. And a hundred years later, it's still happening. The community, despite, you know, George Cahill, a leading, the leading metabolism researcher of the 1960s, 1970s, as well respected a clinician as any man in America or the world in that era, saying ketones are a absolutely normal aspect of metabolism that are secreted by the liver when fat metabolism goes up to fuel the brain. We couldn't live without them. They're not pathological. 2020, they're considered pathological still by half the damn medical community. I would say more than half the medical community. It's just, it's ridiculous. But it's one of my favorite lines in the book. Actually, in this case, I was talking about um, the health effects of vegetarian versus uh, uh, ketogenic diets and the vegan diet doctors who are always attacking ketogenic diets as being unhealthy. And I say the reason they say this is not because they read the research literature or you know do clinical trials comparing vegan diets versus uh, ketogenic diets or treat their patients with vegan versus ketogenic diets and see what works and what doesn't but because they don't. It's because they don't read the literature and they don't do the studies and they don't experiment with themselves or their patients that they could be so dogmatic about their diets being somehow healthier or even healthy. As long as you don't look, if you do nothing to question it, you, you can then speak with complete certainty, assuredness. Yeah. So um, I was talking to Adele Height uh, a couple of days ago, um, and I was, I was telling her about, about the fact that I was going to be talking to you about this. And I was, I was saying to her that I feel like I wanted to maybe suggest that uh, there's another book there, and that is for, for the skinny guy. I mean, you talk, if you kind of focus, you do mention, you know, metabolic disease and all that stuff, but you're really focusing on those people that fatten easily and, and you know, how this is so much better for them. But I'm concerned about the skinny guy. And you even mention marathon runners and, and even Jim Fix, who is, you know, very well known in that community who died of a heart attack while running. Mm -hmm. And um, well, my concern is that we look at, at a skinny person and we say, okay, so they're insulin sensitive and they don't need to worry about what they eat. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I feel like a lot of, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them are actually really ill. You know, I, I think it's clear. I think everyone should avoid sugar and refined grains if they want to maximize their health. And so the, the skinny guy with metabolic syndrome, I mean, the conventional wisdom, right, is he's got it because not physically active enough. So we, there's clearly no marathon runners with metabolic syndrome. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think that's caused primarily by the sugar. That was my last book, The Case Against Sugar. That's mm -hmm. what I would argue, or at least the sugar that our mothers <laughs> consume when they were pregnant with us. And um, by, you know, the refined grains and clearly to minimize chronic disease risk. So those are the changes. I'm less, I don't know what to make of the vegetable oil data. and the Yeah, I'm, I'm, my, my jury's out on that still as well. But yeah. one of the things that but, um, Rob, Rob Sivers has, um, has talked about, and he's actually sh shown that different people have different insulin thresholds, basically. And so he says a lot of these people that, that aren't overweight 
are so because they, they can, their body doesn't produce enough insulin to push all of that stuff into the fat cells. But so what happens then is that their, their um, blood sugars are chronically high all the time. And that leads to these, these other metabolic diseases. And uh, he even said that some of his most metabolically healthy patients are, are some of the fatter ones because they're able to clear the clear the, the glucose out of the bloodstream and they it keeps pushing this fat into the into the fat cells and they and they get bigger and bigger but they them their metabolic markers are still good yeah um, well that was always one of the findings that the morbid obesity for and the idea was as long as you could keep ab absorbing the glucose and this is i actually pointed out in good calories bad calories this fellow carl von norden to whom we owe the calories in calories out hypothesis um, German diabetes specialist around 1903, might have been late 1890s, and the American edition of his book comes out around 1903, 1905, and he has what he calls diabetogenic obesity. And this is his theory. So his theory is that uh, some people, you know, their lean tissue can't take up the glucose anymore, so it goes to the fat and gets stored as fat, and they start getting fatter, and they're still relatively healthy. And then at some point, the fat stops absorbing, and then they have to just, the only thing they can do to keep the blood sugar under control is pee it away. So now they're peeing it away, and now we diagnose them as having frank diabetes. And he said, this is how we, you know, I can make the, the association with obesity and diabetes make sense to me. And I think he was pretty much dead on, right? And this is what, by, so there's always been this observation that as people, as long as they could keep expanding their fat cells, as long as their fat cells stay insulin sensitive, is mm -hmm. another way to think about it, then they have a place to store the fat, deposit, you know, the excess glucose, or burn it for fuel, you know, it's all um, sort of shuttled into the fat. And then it's only when the fat becomes insulin resistant as well, that then they start um, first of all, the polysis goes out of control. So now your free fatty acids go up. You're storing fat viscerally instead of uh, subcutaneously. And, 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 the, you know, um, and now you start getting the metabolic disruption. Um, you know, the, the problem is there are all these other reasons people uh, can't walk around at 400 pounds for too long or 500 pounds. But um, clearly that's the case. The, point I was going to make is just, and I make this in the book, <clears throat> we don't have the studies necessary to tell people that they're going to live longer You're if right. they do eating pattern A versus eating pattern B. They just don't exist. So we could tell them, look, give up carbs, give up the carb-rich foods, live on, you know, what's the correct terminology, animal sourced foods mm. and green leafy vegetables and you'll get healthier. And it's going to happen if you're overweight, obese, diabetic, if you're lean, if you know, to everyone is going to get healthier. And you can, if you're overweight and obese or diabetic, you can be able to feel it, right? You're going to lose weight. You're going to, blood sugar is going to come under control. You can get off all the damn medications. Everything's going to be good. And if you're lean, you're not, maybe not feel it as much, right? Cause you're not going to, but if you do your lipid markers and the like, with the exception of LDL, of course, yeah. um, everything is going to get better and you can feel good about that. Um, we can tell people to do that. We can't, can't tell them they're going to live longer. And that's one reason why the, the that lean, healthy athlete you know, whatever he's doing in this snapshot of time or she is doing is seems to be working. Doesn't mean it's not making her increasingly or him insulin resistant so that they're going to gain weight with time. I have a relative who was a world-class Olympic athlete who hit um, her late 40s and inflated like a balloon. And she thought it was because she stopped caring. That's how she phrased it to me. Yeah. She stopped caring. She stopped trying to run 10 miles a day. She used to run 10 miles a day the way I would walk around the block. You know, go for a 10 mile run, come back, change into her street clothes and go back to work. Um, suddenly she's, you know, wearing a 30, 40, 50 pounds heavier over the course of about two years. And to her, it was a perception that she had stopped making the effort 
but the other perceptions, right, are, you know, hormones had changed. She was secreting less estrogen. She had become slowly insulin resistant over the years, and then it sort of manifested itself. But I just don't feel comfortable telling people they're going to live longer because, you know. You, you just don't it. know. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, trials like that are never really going to exist. Maybe anecdotal data in, in 200 years' time when they, when they go back and look at those people and say, okay, they lived on a ketogenic diet their entire life and put all those numbers together and crunch them and maybe they all show that. Well, that's uh, the thing. If, if, we people, all live, if we all live to be 90, that would be a good sign. Right. But I yeah, wouldn't exactly. But, it, but we've all got it. That's a long time off, right? Even... even well, not only that, we all tended to go on these diets originally. Our conversion experience is because we were metabolic. Because we were sick. Exactly. Yeah, so we lived like 30 years or 20 years or 40 years with this, the wrong diet, and we don't know what damage was done. Right. This is why cl clinical trials are so critically, you just, you can't tell without a clinical trial. And the clinical trials in this case will never be done. But on the other hand, if we all live to be 90 and you know, the vegetarians and vegans don't, that'd be a reasonable sign, but I wouldn't bet on it. And if they lived to be 90 and we didn't, that would evoke some bullshit excuse <laughs> <laughs> to explain why we were sick to begin with, right? So, and now that's going to show up on Twitter as Talbot is the one who acknowledged that he would evoke some bullshit excuse to <laughs> maintain, you know, his belief system intact. Yeah. Well, Gary, it's been brilliant. I actually don't have any more notes uh, that I made while I was reading the book in terms of things I wanted to, to kind of chat with you about. So okay. well, do you you're have supposed... any, anything else that you want to add about the book or about your next book or um, anything? Then now's your time. Speak or forever hold your peace. Okay, well, they, I think there's a few main points I was trying to communicate in this book. Okay, and it's funny because I discussed them um, you know, I gave a case for Keto Talk a couple of years ago, a low carb USA. And mm -hmm. so one of them is we've been getting lean people's diet advice for 100 years now, 90 years. Okay, lean people's advice are eat like I do. I eat healthy. You'll be healthy if you eat like I do. So the whole concept of a healthy diet is basically eat the way lean health conscious people already do. And the argument I'm making here is that when we eat like they do, we get fat and we get hungry. And they have to realize that even though I say, I hope none of them will start the book and say in that first sentence, oh, he says he's not writing to me, so I'm not going to read it. Um, we have to understand that we have to eat differently that we can't eat the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, and legumes and expect to stay lean and healthy because our bodies respond to those foods differently than lean people do. And then the other point that I just keep wanting to repeat, and I've said this before, and it came from Martin Andreas, who's a physician, South African, working in town just outside of Vancouver. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't think of this in the 20 years I've been doing this research and writing about it. Beginning in the 1960s, physicians started being told to prescribe diet by hypothesis. So the idea is if you eat a low fat diet, mostly plants, you know, you get your fats from vegetable oils instead of animal products, you'll delay your risk of heart disease, you'll lessen your risk of heart disease and cancer and you'll live longer. And if you're diabetic or you're pre-diabetic, you might delay the onset of diabetes. So you're going to change your diet now and we hypothesize that you're going to live longer for doing it, but you won't actually feel any different. Okay. You won't lose weight. I mean, if you lose weight, you have to get so whether you live to 70 or you live to 90, whether you die of a heart attack or you die of cancer, you'll never actually know what effect the diet had. There's no information you will be given to say that if you died of a heart attack at 90, you would have died at 80 had you eaten differently. Or you might, that you wouldn't have died to a, lived to 100 if you had eaten differently. We just don't know. So that's diet by hypothesis. And that's what doctors are asked to do every day. And that's what dietitians do. 
and they believe the hypotheses have been well tested, which they haven't been, or they failed to test, which I've documented and Nina Teicholt has documented. The other thing is even if they had succeeded, they're probabilistic statements. So they could be true for some people and not for others. So it might be true that a low fat diet extends the life of some people, but it might shorten the lives of other because you're only looking at, and again, the data doesn't exist to tell you, you only see sort of a probabilistic increase or decrease in risk. The flip side of that is what the diet book doctors say, the quacks, right, the, our allies. Try this, eat like this and you'll get healthier. Okay, you'll get leaner if you're fat, your lipids will improve. If you're diabetic, you'll be able to get off your drugs. You'll be able to, if you're crippled, you can walk, um, you know? Right. But the thing is, you can try their diets and see what happens. And it, it, does a diet do what they tell you it's going to do? Because they're not predicting how long you're going to live or saying, I'm going to extend your life by five or 10 years. You're saying you're going to feel better, feel healthier. If you're overweight, you're going to be leaner. If you're diabetic, you're going to be able to control your blood sugar. You won't need insulin. And you can test all of those things. And we're living proof that at least for some of us, and we think for most and maybe even all, the low-carb, high-fat diet is a solution. But it's not hypothetical. You try it, you see what happens. And then the rest, the second half of my book is basically, if you're going to try it, do it right. Mm. And there's a lot of different ways to think about it. Everybody who writes a diet book has a different way to think about it. Here's the sort of, here are the, the ranges of reasonable opinions. And these are the things you should keep in mind when you experiment with this way of eating to maximize the possibility that it'll help you as it helped us. That's the argument I'm making. And ideally, this is a book. One reason I think our world should buy this book is so this is a book we can give to our doctors and our relatives and our friends to say, look, here's what we're arguing. This is the case for keto. I was about to say exactly that, was that, that if, if I was to say my advice to, to the people listening to this is why you should buy it, even though it's targeted at, at, at someone in general in the public, not someone that's up read up on it. And that's the fact that almost all of us, I'm convinced, have friends or family that we are trying to educate about this change because especially the ones that are getting or are really sick that right. we want to try and help. And we just don't know how to get through to them. And I think that when I would, as I was reading it, I was just thinking, this is the kind of book that I want to let my, my mom read because I need her to, to understand how important this is. Well, and that's um, why part of what I did with the physicians was I was hoping if I can get a physician to read it. So imagine a skeptical physician who's been following the American Heart Association guidelines, but knows that their patients are obese and diabetic. And if you're in internal medicine or family medicine in 2020 in America or most places in the world, most of what you're dealing with are the negative sequelae of obesity, diabetes, hypertension. And you've been writing them drugs. I wanted them to read about the experiences of these other physicians. So they could say to themselves, I want to have that experience. Like I'm willing to experiment because I want to be able to make my patients healthier. And if these people are really doing what Taub says here they're doing, then I should be able to see it for myself mm -hmm. and help. Like nobody goes into medicine to manage disease for 60 years. You know, they go into medicine because they want to help people. And this is, so I wanted to write a book that would also speak to the physicians and say, look, this is what your peers are seeing. This is why they're doing something you think is quackery. Try it. Open your mind. Give it an opportunity to work. So, Yeah. You know, I think there's just so much evidence now that at least it's worth considering for some of your patients or whatever. And, and to the point where I'm, I'm starting to believe that, that a doctor who doesn't at least consider it or, or offer it as an option is actually be, guilty of malpractice. You know, I would too, but 
It's a strange, I, yeah, I think of this diabetes book I'm doing, and I've been interviewing a lot of uh, physicians with type 1 diabetes, because again, you don't have the studies at all, but I think if I could talk to physicians, they're trained to be observant, they're, you know, they, they can be deluded like the rest of us, but they're a good, good way to, for me to learn about this therapy while without with the absence of, of really well done clinical trials. And some of these physicians have been fired by their endocrinologists for being on the diet that was the standard of care until insulin was discovered. Right. Because they have been indoctrinated with this belief that there's one way to eat. And it's interesting, even if you look at the uh, recent American Diabetes Association guidelines. Um, so in 2018, they published nutritional guidelines and they had a committee of nutritionists and a few of uh, open-minded allies of ours were on that committee. So they actually went out of their way to do something they hadn't really done before, which is to look for all the evidence base for all the different diets. And the only diet that was, had been really rigorously tested and it had, you, without exception, been shown to be beneficial for diabetes was the low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. Okay, and they said as much, you had to read between the lines a little, every other study, the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, a vegetarian, they all had mixed results, not, not keto. That's the nutrition committee. Then the next year they published the standard of care, which is written by physicians who are supposed to take into account what the nutritionists concluded but they just reiterate the conventional wisdom. They don't even believe their own expert, or if they did believe it, they didn't, they didn't read what these nutrition authorities had written. When they read their words, they processed it as confirming their conventional thinking. I mean, it's, it's a strange world we're in, it's, you know? Yeah, um, and I think just, uh, I think I'd want to thank you because it started out with your suggestion back in 2018 to try and have a, um, a town hall kind of meeting at our event in San Diego to, uh, to get some feedback from these. I think you got some of your feedback from that or at least from the doctors that came up and spoke that you connected with afterwards. Yeah, um, well that's, um you want to know what really works. I mean, one of the problems we all have is we live in a world of selection bias. So if somebody goes in a ketogenic diet and has a heart attack and dies, we don't hear from them. You would think we would hear from their next of kin or their next of kin's lawyers. Yeah. Luckily, we don't hear from them either, which is a very good sign. In this case, an absence of evidence might mean evidence of absence. Um, the, uh, but it's, you always have to be aware of your own selection biases. And um, so one of the things and we, this is what we talked about, and I talked about it with Adele and what I tried to do in this book is to learn what physicians really see. Like, what are they seeing out there with their patients? And, and what are the challenges their patients facing? Is it true that when you put a paid, can people actually gain weight on a ketogenic diet? Um, it's funny in doing my research for this book, I said, I'm going to actively search for people who did. You know, so there's a, a nutritionist with a popular Twitter account who talked about failing on the ketogenic diet. And I had to track him down and basically beg him to talk to me, which he eventually did. And his failure turned out to be, in my mind, somewhat meaningless. And like he was a young, lean bodybuilder who didn't get his cut on keto that he did on a different way of eating. Um, I found one physician, uh, Indian heritage, Indian, India, Asian mm -hmm. Indian, um, who seemed to get fatter whenever he ate Atkins. I mean, he was, he was metabolically disturbed. He was, uh, he was going to be relatively obese anyway. There was nothing to stop it. But the story he told me was very thoughtful, the way we all can sort of you know, recount how much we weighed at different stages in our life, he could go through the whole thing. And it, it did seem that he gained a significant amount of weight whenever he tried to go low carb or ketogenic and that it was not muscle. 
Um, and right. I can't explain it. And I don't know how he should eat to solve the problem. It's conceivable that the story he was telling me was not true, but I believed him. I have no reason to doubt him. Mm -hmm. um, that was the only example, but it's hard to, you know, you want to know, it's not good enough to know when the diet works. You have to know when it fails or under what circumstances and what to do about it when it's failing and how to, you know, w at what point do you give up and say, look, just do what you were doing, yeah. if ever which I don't believe on ever you go back to a standard American diet, but um, you need that kind of feedback. And I agree. You, That's really important. Yeah. So, I mean, what, you know, you introduced me to Adele to, to mediate that, that session I was talking about yeah. and coming out of that meeting, um, we basically ended up, well, she did, I just kind of cleared the way for her, but you know, to produce those, that, that document, the clinical guidelines for, to, to guide physicians. And if they want to do this in their practice, this is what they can do. And now it's grown from there. And we're about, I'm scrambling right now to, to literally in a couple of days, try and launch this new nonprofit called the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Right. And that is for all people that are open to this concept that lifestyle and dietary interventions um, are, are better most of the time than, um, than drug therapies. And um, if you want, if you're part of that, want to be part of that conversation, you want to come and learn, you want to contribute, um, then here's a place. Our guidelines are moving over. Now they're going to have a real home. Um, and it's, it's going to be a, a fabulous organization. I think it's going to give legitimacy to this whole conversation and a place for people to come and take safe harbor when, and feel like they have some kind of protection, which, and that's, yeah, well, I look forward to saying that's, a, that's exactly what we need. So, um, well, that's all on you. It started from you suggesting well, easy, that, that town easy, hall. It's easy to suggest we need such a thing. It's <laughs> the hard work is in making it happen. So yeah, thank you. But, but yeah, no, I mean, you, you, you'd obviously been talking to Adele a lot about it. So that mm -hmm. was why, you kind of pushed her in my direction. That I, you know, I sent Adele the copy of the book a month ago, and now I'm thinking I never heard from her. Which, and it's un, unusual for Adele to keep her thoughts to herself. <laughs> that, is, that is a true statement, yeah. <laughs> um, it's like, uh-oh, you know, do I have to ask what she thought of the book? Well, um, well, to be honest, I actually, a couple of days ago when I talked to her, I mentioned I was going to do this talk with you. And uh, she did say something to the effect that she hadn't been able to get around to reading it. So oh, okay. that might be why you haven't heard from her. Cause yeah, because I would have thought I would have heard. No, if she'd read it, you would have heard from her for and sure. And I've asked for her feedback. So, you know, oh. I want to hear what Adele. I, I've got a lot of respect for, for Adele. Yeah, yeah she's, for, uh, she's a very, very thoughtful person. And, um, uh, like, you know, her thing she always talks about is that words really matter. And the way you say stuff is, is really important. And well, that's, I had a conversation with the Washington Post columnist who will go unnamed, who wanted to interview me because she wants to write about the book. And so her first question was, so are you recommending, you're, how can you recommend keto to everyone? And I said, well, that's something to that effect. I said, well, I'm not. I mean, read the book. <laughs> so I read, I, I kind of skimmed the book and so I picked the words from the book because I'm very careful in how I phrase everything and everything gets rewritten 20, 30, 40 times. I mean, it's the bane of my existence the number of times I go through something and words matter. Mm -hmm. And so don't tell me what you think you said and what do you believe I may have said and then make me defend something that I'm saying I didn't say. <laughs> You know, quote right. the book. Read the book, yeah. Read the book. So, yeah, I completely get it. And it's one of the issues in this world. We're often left saying, well, you're not, you're missing the point, or you're creating a straw dog, or you're arguing against something that I agree with. You know, that, that I mean, we agree on this. You don't have to, it's just, it's, it's an odd position to be in when you're trying to convince the medical research community um, major medical organizations that they have made a fundamental mistake for, you know, 60 to 100 years, depending on how you want to date it. And uh, that, and, and even to believe you're right. I mean, I have these 
conversations with uh, my colleague, Mark Friedman, where I say, how can we be so confident we're right? You know, the, the defining characteristic of being a quack, right, is yet you're convinced you're right. And the, yeah, I'm always quoting Richard Feynman saying the fundamental um, uh, principle of science is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. So how do we know we're not fooling ourselves? And Mark says, well, because we're not. I know, but every quack thinks that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then they say, well, you can't be a quack because you're not a doctor. So the best you could, you know, achieve is like whack job, nutcase. Anyway. Yeah. Well, Gary, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for, for doing this, for, for helping us to try and educate people because it's just, you know, it's become uh, sort of the, the center point of my life is to, try and, uh, is to try and teach more people about this because I was so flabbergasted that I didn't know anything at the age of 51 or something that I knew. Yeah. I didn't even know what a ketone was back then, you know. Um, and, and so since then, my main aim has been to try and find ways to, to reach more people and not the people in the bubble that already get it. Yeah, yeah it's cool to educate them further, but we need to reach people outside of the bubble. So well, stuff like yours that goes mainstream is, is going to do <clears> that. So that's awesome. That's the, yeah, the advantage I have as a journalist is I can still, I mean, I'm hoping, I'm worried that the, the publicity I'm getting for this book so far is a lot of keto podcasts. And the oh. keto people already get it, right? That's why they're listening to the podcast. Um, I mean, I do think, like I said, there's a lot that we could all learn about sort of how to think about this and communicate it and think about it in our own lives, how to experiment when things go awry. Um, yeah, this idea. Yeah. And, um, how to, and, how, and how to teach our friends and family and that we haven't been yeah. able to get through. I think that, and then in that way, even though the keto person reads it first, I believe it's going to be a tool to then reach more people. So you'll secondhandly uh, reach, uh, uh, reach people that aren't in this community. And I think well, that's, that's the goal. If yeah. nothing else, you know, if we can get people to stop thinking this is a fad diet or a fringe diet or a frenzy or something that's going to come and go, I mean, it might have a new name five years from now. I wouldn't be at all surprised. It's like the K diet or something. Yeah. But it doesn't go away because it works. And it doesn't no, go away. It might be stays. called something different, but the concept's going to be here to stay for sure. Yeah. Okay, Doug. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Last, okay. last word I've got to say is read the book. Words read the to book. say. Thank you. Read the um, book. I appreciate it. And I think everyone should, but I'm biased. I'm the author. <laughs> you know. yeah, I think you're allowed to be biased about this one. I hope so. We'll see. Okay. I'm, uh, I don't know what to think. You know, it's interesting just because, again, originally it was called How to Think About How to Eat. And then Bittman and Katz, David Katz and Mark Bittman had a book coming out called How to Eat a Month Before Mine, Ugh. month and a half before mine. So I realized we had to change the title and my editors went for the case for keto because it resonated with the case against sugar. They like resonation. And I thought it's going to get locked into the keto world, whereas, which it might. But on the other hand, keto is hot. So maybe they're right and it'll sell more books. But because um, even if you can get the people who are just thinking of doing it, yeah, uh, you know, and they need to understand the rationale. So they're not, you know, there's, there's got to be the few tens of millions who are thinking maybe I should try that keto thing. <laughs> maybe that'll work. Right. Because I was just reading, I was reading a book, actually, whoop, where'd we go? I was reading a book called, uh, just came out in November, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. And it's written by a, a young uh, blogger, podcaster who is morbidly obese and about sort of the burden, the terrible sort of psychological burden of being obese and the, how society treats you and all the, it's heartbreaking reading this book. Um, and then she talks about how all diets have failed her. So mostly she tries to eat healthy. And of course, she defines healthy the way the establishment does, because that's what she's been taught. So she thinks she's supposed to eat mostly plants. And, um, but then she talks about Atkins failing her. And she, you know, she tried it for these couple sentences. I tried Atkins. I lost some weight. Then I gained it back. 
And maybe the question is, did she gain it back because it stopped working or did she gain it back because it didn't, you know, she... Because she wasn't doing the Atkins diet anymore, for one thing. Yeah, she stopped doing the diet. She, didn't, she thought, I'll go on Atkins, I'll lose 30 pounds, and then I'll start adding bread back. And, uh, you know, so it would be nice for somebody like that to think, well, if I'm going to do it, I should understand. that. I should understand what I'm doing, that carbohydrates are fattening, I can't eat those foods. If I don't eat those foods... Maybe instead of weighing 350 pounds, I weigh 200 pounds. Now, 200 pounds is still not lean, but maybe at 200 pounds, if I can feel I can sustain that without mm. being hungry all the time, I don't care if I eat bread anymore. It's interesting, reading the diabetes research, I'm gonna end with this because I know I'm rambling. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> the diabetes doctors like the 19th century are saying nothing will make somebody, nobody, if you ask people what their favorite foods are, bread will never come up. But if you tell a diabetic they can't eat bread ever again, that's all you hear is about how it's their favorite food. <laughs> yeah. You know? And what I don't get, you know, people talk about like the Atkins diet failed me or any diet failed me. And, and some of them actually lost a bunch of weight. So if, even if it's severe calorie restriction or whatever, so they lose a bunch of weight and then they start eating like they were eating that made them and got Before, them and well, when they were really fat. So... How do they expect, what do they think the diet's supposed to do? Let them lose weight and then they can eat whatever they want well, and they're just going to stay that way. That like, was the way we used to think about it. That's why the people stop using the term diet, right? Because a diet is something you go on until you've accomplished your goal and then you go off. It's one reason I want, one of the things I wanted to sort of straighten out in my way in this book, like diets come with theories attached, right? Mm -hmm. And the theory is the theory of why you got your problem to begin with. So even if you turned green and the diet is don't eat green vegetables because the assumption is that green vegetables make you green. So if you didn't eat the green vegetables, you wouldn't be green anymore. But nobody would think, okay, I'm going to avoid green vegetables turn back to flesh color and then go back to eating the vegetables and I'm not going to turn exactly. green. Exactly, yeah. But here, that's how we all thought. Go on the diet, lose the weight, because nobody really thought deeply about the diet. So read the, lot, the, the reality is when we were young, the people doing nutrition research were just not all that bright. The smartest person in the room, I'm going to get eviscerated for saying the smartest person in the world room did not become a dietitian or a nutritionist or even a nutrition researcher. They went and, you know, the guys in your high school, the smart, the, the valedictorians went into physics or they went to Wall Street. They might have become doctors, mm -hmm. you know, or they went into government. They didn't go into teaching people how to eat because everyone thought that was obvious. They also thought the reason we get fat is obvious. So, you know, we've got all these crazy ideas out there. I'm arguing with this Washington Post reporter who thinks that the healthiest diet is a diet you could stick with. And I said, well, I was on a low fat diet to the nineties, mostly plants, probably 15% fat. I lived in Los Angeles and I gained two pounds a year. Mm. I could have continued doing that for the rest of my life and getting fatter. How can that possibly be the healthiest possible diet? And they go, well, you know, your body, what works for you? Then it's like, well, everybody's different and what works for you. But it's sort of, they don't, they don't think about, they just don't think about it deeply. They come up with some facile explanation. You get, you lose weight when you eat less. You, the diet that works is a diet that works for you, you know, that you can comply with. And then they stick with it for life. And it's just, yeah. Meanwhile, everybody else gets fatter and more diabetic and they blame us because we don't stick to their diets, even though we're sticking our diets, which are in theory, the healthiest diets. It's just, right. anyway. Okay. Um, Doug? Yeah, it's been great, Gary. Thank you. We need, a, we need everybody to help us promote this because that's how, you know, at the end of the day, we, we put food on the table as well. So, um, yeah. It's been, you know, it's been a struggle. We, we living on fumes and, yeah. um, but I, you know, stuff's coming together now and I really think this, this um, nonprofit's going to do really well. And, and so, um, at some point that can possibly start paying a salary or something. And then are you going to charge dues? Yeah. So there's going to, there's going to, there's going to be membership basically. So anybody can join, add their name in as a provider and it's, 
it's it's pretty phenomenal what the database of these guys is, is as much as they've killed me in terms of the development what they're actually producing is really cool and you can go in edit your you know once you've registered you can uh edit your profile and it's it's really well presented and really magic the search engines that they've created are, are amazing beyond the, the, the what we had on NoCarb USA, you could search by zip code yeah. and city if you were in a different country. Um, now you can search on doctor's name, uh, city, zip code, state, country, speciality, uh, category. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool. And, and anybody can join that, and like put the information in. And then if they upgrade as members, then um, we've got these forums that we, we're going to, we've got in place now that people can um, have discussions and stuff, which will hopefully, most of it's gonna be talking about the, the, you know, cases and um, Adele's clinical guidelines documents right. and all of that conversation, if, especially since it's documented, can then become standard of care because as Adele was at pains to point, to point out to me that what, even if they wanna call it a document standard of care, it's not. The legal definition is is literally a consensus among doctors with the same training as to what they agree is is a, is a pretty good course of action in any situation um, and so we have to get those conversations going and to do that um, and then there's, a, there's we're actually defining accreditation pathways so that there's a, a bunch of different ways including you know full-on training um, path but also extended clinical experience or, um, you know, if they did a bunch of research and, and did, did some clinical trials and stuff like that, um, they can submit that and write about it and do the ethics module and stuff and can get credited that way. Yeah, they can use the, the, uh, the credentials MHP and they'll have an, an extra badge in their profile that's, that shows that they're accredited and, um, I'm, I'm excited. It is exciting. Well, let me know, of course. I'll help uh, I'll tweet, which is my yeah, word. I'll, I'll, once, once this thing, thing goes live, I will, I will send the links to you. And, and like I said, any help would be much appreciated. Thanks. No, I'd be delighted. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Doug. Okay, mate, thank you very much. And I'll hopefully next time, uh, we, we, at the moment, we're planning end of August for San Diego. I but, um, would think that we'll be traveling. That, that that will be I, I i've got to hope so man it's like seriously otherwise I, unless there's something backfires with the vaccines um i so got you're thinking think, that the vaccines are going to be uh are going to be available by then uh yeah i don't i mean just the way people are talking you know i don't know if 300 million will be available i don't know again i don't know anything more than you do but i i do think that by yeah. I'm assuming that by late spring, I'll have been vaccinated for good or for bad. Um, you know, the... Uh, well, let's hope so. I'm, I'm counting on it at this stage. Yeah, no, that's the thing. I would think by next, late then, next summer, things will start to feel like normal. That's my, that was always my bet. <laughs> so I'm sticking with it. <laughs> You're sticking with it, okay. Yeah. I hope so. Okay. It's been Take a pleasure, care. Gary. Thank you very much. You too. Good night. Okay, man. Bye. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.